Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and welcome to FIM. And thank you for uh, uh, your presence today. Uh, first of all, uh, really thank you. Um, this audience, uh, um, in a way, confirms the value of uh, the Economy and Society program uh, that has been launched uh, one year ago, one year and a half ago. So month by month, we are having different lectures. M many of you, I, I can recognize many of you, and uh, thank you so much for continuously um, coming in our lectures. Um, by the way, thank you very much to Giuseppe San Marco, our executive director, that uh, uh, believe uh, and um, in this program and uh, give us uh, every day very good uh, inspirations. Secondly, a special thank to our lecturer, Francisco Ferreira, a World Bank Chief Economist for the Africa region and research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn for accepting our invitation uh, and for finding time for us uh, despite his very, very hectic um, schedule. Um, he, uh, you were in uh, Africa yesterday, you are here today, you are in US tomorrow, so you can imagine. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you particularly considering that today uh, this lecture will address a very um, important and strategic topic that practically fits the inspiration of our new program. Uh, today, actually, Africa uh, has an unprecedented opportunity for growth. And uh, this is particularly true in case of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, with a 5% average uh, growth rate in the last decade, um, Sub-Saharan Africa can readily transform its economic and uh, its social sectors. Despite this very positive trend and consolidated trend, some important limits are still there. Undiversified and not efficient production sectors, poor investment in human capital, weak governance, political frailty, and uh, we can say a permanent asymmetry in social stratification. We can say in a, in a nutshell that there is a broken link between economic growth and poverty reduction, and this broken link needs to be addressed. For this reason, the World Bank launched and designed uh, a new development strategy in Africa that go and will go beyond the traditional fight to poverty and put new measures in place. It goes without saying that uh, the development and growth of a continent uh, that potentially holds a piv pivotal role, uh, and role in world economy, uh, it's so important and can bring a profound change in consolidated scenario. That's why today um, we are giving to you, to this uh, audience, uh, a unique opportunity, and we could not hope to host a better lecturer than Francisco. Uh, to address uh, such a complex and uh, important topic. Francisco, in fact, uh, has a wide experience in the fields of poverty and uh, inequality in developing countries. He was formerly a lead economist in the Bank Research Department, serv served as deputy chief uh, economist for Latin America and the Caribbean, and as co-director of the World Development Report 2006 on uh, inequity and poverty. Um, Francisco has published uh, widely and was awarded um, many prizes, many pro important prizes for uh, his research on these topics. So therefore today we have uh, really again a unique opportunity to learn more about the World Bank new development strategies directly from the experience of one of its main representatives and from an internationally renowned expert in the field. So I don't want to take any more time for uh, this lecture, and uh, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Francisco Ferreira. Again, thank you very much for your kind attention, and we really hope you will enjoy our lecture today. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Filippo, for the, the very kind introduction, uh, possibly a little too generous. Uh, the pleasure is entirely mine to be here in, in Milan. It was a lovely way to come uh, from Lusaka, where I was yesterday on my way, on my way back. And it's a great pleasure to be, to be here with you today. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to do, ah, and my apologies for not giving the lecture in Italian, but uh, I, can't, I can't do that. So um, thank you for listening to it in English. Um, what, what I want to, to do 
is uh, talk a little bit about this broken link that, uh, that, that Filippo mentioned uh, between growth uh, and poverty reduction in Africa. Um, and, and because uh, when you talk about growth and poverty reduction, uh, inevitably the distribution mediates that, I want to talk about inequality um, as well. Uh, the talk has three parts. <clears throat> In the first one, I want to delve a little bit deeper into the growth story. We've all heard about Africa rising um, and, and the very impressive uh, performance in growth in the last few years. And I want to talk a little bit about that, but also uh, look a little bit at the patterns of growth and the differences in growth across countries, but also within countries. Uh, look a little bit at the taxonomy of growth in Africa. Um, and then from there, I want to talk about what kind of impacts that growth is or is not having on poverty and how that effect is mediated by inequality. So that's the analytical part, the first two-thirds of the talk. And then in conclusion, I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> four key policy areas uh, that we tend to see in the Africa region of the World Bank as essential uh, components of a, of a strategy to, <coughs> to make that growth more inclusive. And my apologies, I'm getting a little bit of a cold from uh, you know, the transition between uh, the, the heat and the air conditioning and planes and all of that stuff. Uh, but I will, I will, then the four areas are macroeconomic management in the current external scenario, uh, investment in human and physical capital, uh, and those two in a sense are the broad, uh, the broad brush kind of distribution neutral components of growth. And then the next two um, are the ones which are really focused on making growth more inclusive, and they are promoting growth in the places and sectors where the, poors, the poor people are, as well as creating mechanisms such as social protection and promotion systems that enable the poor to share in growth taking place elsewhere. But we'll get to that at the end. So let me start with, uh, with the growth profile, and let me start, in fact, with the long-term picture of that, which is the sort of uh, growth picture in Africa um <coughs> in the post-independence period, the long view. So this is uh, the levels of GDP per capita in logarithms. Uh, let me make sure this is on, yeah. Uh, from 1960 to, to today, and it's this amazing N-shaped curve, right? It's quite a striking curve in the sense that these are levels, although they're in logs. Uh, so there was growth in the 60s up until around the first oil shock in 1973-74. And then this marked period of prolonged and sustained decline in the levels of GDP per capita in, the, in, in these countries. So this is the average for sub-Saharan Africa. And you really observe a tragedy there of these two lost decades between around 1973-74 and around 1993-94. As a consequence, both of an external uh, environment which was detrimental to Africa, but also of a number of, uh, of failed policy paradigms and experiments um, around nationalization and other, uh, uh, and, uh, and other strategies, as well then as a very painful and perhaps poorly administered medicine for that, which was structural adjustment in the 1980s, where the World Bank and the IMF are themselves in part to blame, perhaps, for some of that. So those, uh, those uh, that was a period that was uh, uh, <coughs> quite a dramatic period. When in our uh, uh, mindset, we returned to seeing Africa as this dark and lost continent where things were, were going wrong. Um, now, as you know, if you, if you follow the African, uh, the African story a little bit, the, the, the narrative is now quite different. So beginning in the mid-90s, you see this big rise again, which is what you know, uh, Africans and others refer to as the Africa rising story. So these are now 20 years of sustained growth, which have led um, Africa to pass its previous peak. And so we now have a GDP per capita higher than we've ever had before. And if you go, for example, to Lusaka, where I was yesterday, um, I was with a colleague who'd been there 15 years before, and he said the place is unrecognizable. And you hear that um, uh, about city after city in Africa. So it's not happening everywhere, as we're about to see, but there clearly is some growth. <coughs> of course, one should uh, be cautious that that growth that we have seen by no means implies that Africa is converging to the living standards of the rich world. What we have here um, is those levels uh, in the blue line, which is sub-Saharan Africa. We have the, the level, 
uh, of GDP per capita relative to the Eurozone GDP per capita. So you see that, of because, you know, of course, whilst Africa's GDP was declining between the 70s and the 90s, Europe kept growing, albeit slowly. So in fact, this, this uh, line here keeps trending down until around 2002 or so, when it picks up slowly again. Um, the two other lines are for when you divide Africa into two groups. One gr so there's uh, 44 countries there, and we divided them into the the faster growing sample and the slower growing sample. And the faster growing sample was defined as countries that managed to grow at 3.5% per capita per year for at least five years in a row. So <coughs> that managed to sustain growth booms <coughs> for a reasonable period. It turns out with that definition there are 21 countries, which is almost half the sample. These are the green here, and, and the slower growing ones are the red over here. So a few things to note about that. First of all, the most impressive numbers in this, in this chart, as you can see, are the absolute levels, or, or, ra or rather the, the, the levels of, of, of well-being of, of, of GDP per capita in Africa relative to Europe, you know, 3%. Okay? So however much there has been growth, there clearly is a very long way to go. Living standards at PPP exchange rates are still at around 3% of what they are in the euro area, despite this growth. Okay? Um, so the other thing to notice is that there is convergence within Africa, even if the convergence between Africa and the West is slow, because these are the fast-growing countries. You can see that they are lower than the slow-growing countries. So by and, and by definition, since these are faster than these ones, that gap has been narrowing. So there is some convergence within Africa. But this picture reminds us that despite the big success, you know, clearly a lot of work remains to be done. There's no reason why Africa is, should be condemned to be poorer than the West, but clearly there is a long way to go until they catch up. <coughs> now to talk about this growth, one thing that I think we can emphasize is that in many ways, this growth has been high quality. And let me talk about two of them. What, what we have here is an index of GDP, uh, the median GDP for uh, these 44 countries that we're looking at, uh, divided up uh, by uh, uh, components of aggregate demand, if you like. And what you see is that investment, which is this line over here, is growing, and that's public and private investment, is growing much faster than consumption, public and private. The other two lines up there are imports and exports. So the, the things that you notice, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the things that you notice are that this is investment rather than consumption-driven growth, which is good because it makes it sustainable. M in my own country, Brazil, has had a growth experience in the last 10 years or so, which is coming down quite dramatically now, in part because it was consumption-driven rather than investment-driven. So this is about capital accumulation that's going on, which is good news. It's also in relatively open economies. It's economies that, that are participating fully in the international trading system and therefore exports and imports are growing fast. So there are elements of this growth, both its sustainability and its composition, that are encouraging. Nevertheless, I do want to paint a nuanced picture for you this evening, and so there are some caveats that I want to highlight. In fact, I want to highlight three uh, important caveats. The first of them is that the Africa rising narrative is always told in terms of GDP. But when you look at GDP per capita, it's a little bit different. So this graph here is GDP. The red line is China. The blue line is Sub-Saharan Africa. And the yellow bars are the other developing countries. Okay? And <coughs> the averages are 9.9%. So this is growth in between 99 and 2012. The, the average for the Chinese line is 9.9% GDP growth. For, Af for Africa, the blue line is 4.5%, and the yellow line, the yellow bars, are 3.6%. So the interpretation is, look, Africa is growing, it's not growing as fast as China, but it's growing faster than the rest of the developing world. And this is a wonderful thing, and indeed it is a wonderful thing, but you know, total GDP is, is one way to look at things. Another way to look at things is GDP per capita, and when you look at GDP per capita, it's a little less impressive. There, you know, the Chinese are not having rapid population growth, as we know, so their number just comes down to 9.2%. The uh, <coughs> other developing countries come down to 2.5%, and Africa, the, the blue line in the, in the bottom diagram, comes down to 1.8%. That difference between 45 and 1.8%, between the top and the bottom charts, 
are Africa's, you know, are accounted for by Africa's very rapid population growth at 2.7% per year. So that demographic, the fact that Africa's population is expanding so rapidly, does show up a little bit when you, when you, when you start to look at growth in terms of per capita rather than total growth. <coughs> a second caveat is that, as you would expect, growth is not uniform in the region. And in fact, it varies quite substantially across different types of countries. I'm now going to stay with numbers that are in per capita terms because I think those are most more informative of, of real well-being than, um, than total GDP. Uh, so here we have Africa <coughs> <coughs> on average, which is the red line. <coughs> and then two taxonomies, two little divisions into different groups. Fragile countries in blue and non-fragile in yellow, and then resource-rich and resource-poor countries in orange and in green. So you may ask, what's a fragile country? It's, it's a definition that we use at the World Bank and the UN and, and, and other organizations. The definition is that a country is fragile if it has had <coughs> a UN or regional peacekeeping force in its country, in the country, in the last three years, or if its country policy and institutional assessment rating, CPIA rating, is less than 3.2. That doesn't mean anything to you, didn't mean anything to me until very recently either, but the <laughs> CPIA is a, a, a way of assessing the quality of countries' policy and institutions that is done uh, uh, within, the, within the World Bank. So basically, let's think of these countries in the blue, li in the blue line as very fragile states, almost failed states, <coughs> or states that have had conflict within the last three years, okay? So uh, 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 you can see a very big difference between the blue and the yellow line, right? So whereas fragile countries had a growth rate of 1.2% per capita, non-fragile countries had a growth rate of 2.3%. So clearly the Africa rising story is not uniform. Neither is it uniform, interestingly, between resource-rich and non-resource-rich countries. I, I often get asked, you know, is the is the African growth story driven by natural resources? And there are many countries in which it is not. And we'll come in a moment to some examples of that, th which include Ethiopia and Rwanda, for example. But on average, when you look, yes, there is more rapid growth amongst the, uh, <coughs> the resource-rich countries, 2.6%, vis-a-vis the non-resource-rich at 1.7%. <coughs> <coughs> so that's the second caveat. The first caveat was per capita is lower. The second caveat is that the performance is heterogeneous across countries. The third, ca oh, before I get to the third caveat, another way of looking at that is to look at these two, two charts here. So up there, <coughs> we have, in, in both charts, we have the same countries, exactly the same countries. And the bars are there. Uh, GDP growth per capita on average between 1995 and 2012 um, in, annual, in annual rates. Right? In the top graph, you've got the resource-rich countries in orange. And the point is that you know, the orange bars tend to be to the right of this graph. Okay? Although you can see, as I was saying, that there are some non-resource-rich uh, countries that are growing quite strongly. Cape Verde, Rwanda, and Ethiopia in particular, uh, but also... Uh, Uganda and Mauritius doing very well. So there are some very successful non-resource-rich countries, but on the whole, the resource-rich countries are growing <coughs> faster. In the bottom, we show the, the fragile <coughs> and conflict-affected states in red. And you can see that with the exception of Liberia, which is basically a, 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 res a conflict country. Oops, don't go away. Uh, a conflict country that was booming back after the Civil War. So after the Civil War, there was a, a kind of rebound, and that's what this is picking up here. Apart from that, you know, um, the red bars tend to be towards the left, and in particular, all of the countries that actually lost GDP per capita in this period, all of them are uh, <coughs> uh, countries that are fragile or conflict-affected, like Zimbabwe, <coughs> Burundi, Guinea-Bissau, <coughs> Eritrea, and so on. Um, I was told uh, 
uh, no, that's uh, that that's it for for this for this for this for this graph. So that that's still the heterogeneity across countries. Now, as I was saying, there's also heterogeneity within countries across sectors. Within each economy, these countries are not growing in the same way. Okay. In fact, the 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 sectoral composition of growth is quite different. And when we look at these uh, 44 countries and and the average for them. We see uh, a big growth in the resource sector, that's in green, the service sector, that's in yellow, um, and, and slower growth in agriculture and manufacturing. <coughs> this growth in services is really quite, quite remarkable. Um, and what it means is that when we look uh, here, we look only at the fast-growing countries, the ones that I mentioned before to you that have you know, this growth of 3.5%. Uh, uh, per capita for at least five years. So that's the upper half of the sample. And we divide them between the, the resource-rich part of that sample and the non-resource-rich part of that sample. And in both, you see the resources sector strong, but not particularly, you know, the composition not, sh not, not changing very much. These are shares, okay? What we have here are the shares of GDP earlier in the blue bar and then later in the, in the orange bar. And, you know, resources are not changing very much. What you see is a decline in the agriculture and manufacturing shares and an increase <coughs> in the service share. This <coughs> relates very much to a conversation that's very important in Africa today, which is that of structural economic transformation. So, you know, in Accra, for example, in Ghana, there's a whole center called ASSET, which is a center for economic transformation. And if you go to the annual meetings of the African Development Bank or any big conversation with businessmen on Africa. They, they're talking about growth is not enough. We need to diversify. We need to diversify our economies. We need to move away from a reliance on agriculture and natural resources and onto other things. But my sense is, in the back of most people's minds, they think of that movement as a movement to manufacturing. And that's not what's happening. What's happening is a movement away from agriculture and manufacturing in shares. Okay, manufacturing is growing. I mean, I just showed you. Manufacturing and, and agriculture is growing. Everything is growing. But in terms of shares, in terms of composition, it is services that are picking up dramatically. And services are a hugely heterogeneous sector, right? They, the vast majority of the people working in services are working in petty trade and retail and marketing, you know, African women in the markets, uh, trade across borders, relatively low productivity services. Then you've also got huge growth in frontier services, um, mobile banking, mobile telecommunications, um, you know, uh, uh, Nollywood in Nigeria, what have you. Okay, so there's a, a heterogeneity there, which is quite interesting as well uh, <coughs> when you look at, uh, at services. Um, so this was the picture of growth I wanted to, to paint. I mean, I, I, I didn't go very deep. But, um, but I scratched a little bit the surface to say that behind that rapid growth in the last 20 years, um, there's a lot of differences, right? Uh, there's, there's differences across components of aggregate demand, and some of that is really good news because this is investment-driven growth, which is, in that sense, high quality, okay? But of course, there's heterogeneity across countries with fragile countries and countries that have no natural resources doing relatively worse than institutionally stronger countries and those that have natural resources. And then there's interesting patterns of different growth in different sectors of the, of the economy. Now, <coughs> let's turn to the second part, which is the effect that this growth is having on what we at the World Bank care most about, and I suspect many of you care most about as well, which is the ability of this growth to uh, improve the living standards of the poor you know, which, which, which uh, are still very numerous in Africa. A and there the picture, as Filippo already suggested in his introduction, is mixed. So this graph is, is one that's, that's uh, wide, widely used in the World Bank. It's due to uh, colleagues of ours, uh, Martin Ravallion and Shawa Chen's work. Uh, some of this is published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, what this is, is uh, the incidence of poverty at $1.25 a day, so $1.25 a day is a poverty line, what share of these different regions, okay, so the six regions into which the bank classifies economies in the developing world, Sub-Saharan Africa, <coughs> South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, Middle East and North Africa, 
Europe and Central Asia, what proportion of those economies, uh, of those populations, are living under a dollar twenty-five um, a day? And you know, here's three relative three sort of, let's call them middle-income regions, LAC, MENA, and ECA, uh, you know, the numbers are, are relatively low. Now let's look at these other three, which are where the bulk of the poor are, uh, Africa, East Asia, and South Asia. Over this 20-year period, you see a remarkable divergence there, um, with Africa and East Asia beginning more or less at the same place, right, at around 56% of the people in poverty, and then both managed to reduce it, I mean, Africa, af after this period here, when it went up to 58, did reduce it. <coughs> so the first thing I want to say is that this African growth is reducing poverty. Reduce it by eight percentage points, which is good news. But that's much, much less than what East Asia did. East Asia managed to reduce its poverty by 44 percentage points, you know, from 58 to or 56 to 12 or something, right? So the question we have is why is that transmission between this growth and poverty lower uh, in, in Africa than in other places? And <coughs> just descriptively, <coughs> one way to talk about that is the concept of a growth elasticity of poverty, which is nothing deep, it's just a description. It just tells you by what proportion does poverty fall for each one percentage point in growth. That's an elasticity. It's the proportional fall in poverty given a 1% increase in growth. And here I've uh, plotted those elasticities for 30 countries around the world. And in order not to pick my sample any way I wanted, I just picked the five most populous countries from each of the six regions, okay, for which we had data. So you'll notice that for Africa, I don't have the DRC there, for example, because to have this data, you have to have two comparable surveys at different points in time so you can compute the elasticity. But they are otherwise... Uh, uh, f the five most populous, except you know, Poland is missing <coughs> in ACA and Sri Lanka is missing in South Asia. Now, these numbers are all negative, as you can see. The zero line is above. They're negative because a 1% increase in growth typically reduces poverty, so poverty falls. And you want them to be as large as possible, right? So you want to be on this end over here, where 1% increase in growth, 1% increase in GDP, b buys you a lot of poverty reduction. Okay, and in red, I've put the five African economies I had data for, which are South Africa, Tanzania, <coughs> Uganda, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. And uh, you can see that they are all the way to the right. They are the lowest elasticities of this set. So <coughs> the averages for the rest of the developing world, excluding Africa, is this green line here, minus two, okay, which says that on average in the developing world, given the data that we have at the moment, 1% increase in GDP per capita or in mean household survey, can be computed either way, leads to a 2% decline in poverty, in, 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 in the poverty headcount, the proportion of poor people. In Africa, that's that green bar over there, which is minus 0.7. So clearly, you know, that growth is, uh, <coughs> is, is not as good at reducing poverty as it is in the rest of the world. Now, why might that be? Um, again, without necessarily getting into the deeper economic causes of it and staying a little bit at the statistical level, um, it's clear that that has something to do with inequality. Um, and it has to do with inequality in two ways. The first is the level of inequality, or, or rather, I'm sorry, the inequality in levels of income. And the second is the inequality in the growth rates itself, themselves. Okay? So let me give you a simple example of this, which I think fixes ideas. So if a cake is very unequally distributed, right? So that the bulk of the poor people get very, very small slices. Then when you raise that cake by 10%, it's harder to move these poor people above the poverty line than if their shares had been a little bit bigger. So even the level of initial inequality matters uh, for how growth translates into, into poverty. And how is inequality distributed across Africa? So this figure has uh, all of the countries that we had in our PovCal database for which we had these Gini coefficients, which are a measure of income inequality across <laughs> countries. There's for slightly different years, but they are the latest ones we have. <coughs> you know what I think? I think we're using that slightly older version because I'm s it's the arrows are still pointing to Zambia. <laughs> 
But I'll, I'll carry on. I had some arrows pointing to Mozambique because Filippo told me that you guys were more interested in Mozambique. So, um, but but I, we have the two presentations in the computer. I'm not going to change them right now. The, 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 the bulk of the presentations are the same. Uh, so when we, when we look here, right, we've got all these different countries with Gini coefficients. The different colors are as follows. Um, red is Africa. Blue are other countries. Light blue is a consumption Gini. And dark blue is an income genie. And I mark them that way because if you follow these kinds of things, you know that the consumption genies are always lower than the income genies. So you shouldn't really compare them. So I'm showing at least which ones are income and which ones are consumption. For Africa, they're all red because they're all consumption with one exception, which is Namibia, which uses income. Okay? So two things to take away for me uh, from this picture. One is how um, <coughs> disparate inequality is in Africa. So you've got countries... <coughs> with relatively low levels of inequality, like Mali and Burundi and Ethiopia there at that end with, with Gini coefficients just in the 30s, which are really quite low. Okay? On the other hand, you have a whole bunch of countries here at the end which are, have much higher levels of, of, of inequality. That's different, for example, from my own region and a region that I know much better and have studied much longer, which is Latin America, uh, where um, inequality differs across countries, but much less. Latin American countries are all towards this upper end here, okay? So that's one difference. Second difference, second interesting thing about this picture is that for a Latin American like me is that I expect that these countries up here to be mostly Latin American. But it turns out when you have all the countries in the world lined up like this, that in the top 10, seven of the, most, of the 10 most unequal economies, seven are in Africa. Yeah? They are the Seychelles, Comoros, Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, and the Central African Republic. So there is a, a, a core of countries, mostly in Southern Africa, some in Central Africa, <coughs> the two islands, <coughs> that, uh, that are very unequal. And of course, as I was saying, when you have that inequality in levels, that just by itself is going to lower your growth elasticity of poverty. It's going to make it harder <coughs> for a given amount of growth to, um, to, uh, to reduce poverty. But of course, Things are even worse if, in addition to inequality in levels, in the starting levels, the inequality in the changes is also there. And it's not everywhere, but in many places in Africa, we see that through pictures like this. This is a growth incidence curve. Some of you may be familiar with these things. They're very simple things. What they are is they give you the growth rate not for a country, but for each percentile of the distribution in the country. So you look at two surveys and you ask, how much higher is the income of the poorest 1% in, say, 2010 vis-a-vis uh, -vis 2004? Okay? Now, this is annualized, so it's not the cumulative of 2004, 2010. It's the annual rate of growth for the bottom 1%, the next 1%, blah, 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 all the way to the 98, 99, 100, uh, 99 percentile here, right? Uh, so <coughs> divide the distribution into hundreds and see how they grow. So what you see here is <coughs> Malawi, one of the poorest countries in Africa. Very good growth story in aggregate. Uh, uh, over this period, it was growing by 6.5% per annum. Okay? Uh, and this is per capita now. This is not GDP. This is per capita household consumption. Impressive growth, 6.5% per annum. But that growth was skewed. And whilst these guys at the top here were growing at 8%, the very bottom here was growing at, you know, one, two, three, four percent, okay? So, of course, when that's happening, inequality not only is high, but it's growing. And, of course, then also it means that that mapping of 6.5 percent to poverty reduction is going to be weaker because, actually, the growth is not taking place amongst the poor. It's taking place elsewhere, okay? <coughs> These inequalities in levels or changes in income generally reflect also deeper inequalities, inequalities in opportunities that are available to different people. So um, here, for example, we have uh, a, 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 a figure, uh, a, a picture of uh, completion of grade six in primary school uh, amongst 15 to 19 year olds. So it's a measure of schooling attainment that captures both enrollment and delay, okay? So it, it's capturing 
Uh, the extent to which 15 to 19 year olds have managed to complete gra grade six, which, th which they should have done under standard conditions by, uh, by age 13. Right? If they entered at seven and done six grades, they would have finished by age 13. There are delays, there is evasion. So how many of these kids um, have finished grade six between 15 and 19? The red line is the average for different countries. Uh, these, are con these come from the DHS, the Demographic and Health Survey. <coughs> so the dates, <coughs> uh, the dates differ widely, but nevertheless it gives you a sense. Okay? So there's big differences on averages themselves. I mean, if you look at the red line, it goes from around 20% of those kids in Niger and the Central African Republic uh, all the way to uh, uh, you know, almo almost 90% in South Africa and uh, Zimbabwe. Um, here I, I, I had made a note of Mozambique, for example, again in the presentation that I changed in the plane, the arrow was in Mozambique. But Mozambique is all the way there. It's, uh, it's, it's, it does quite poorly, really. Okay. Now, the more interesting thing even is to look at the differences between the blue bars and the green bars. And those are the <coughs> completion rates for kids <coughs> in the bottom quintile, so in the poorest 20% of these distributions in the blue bars, and in the top quintile in the green bars. And you see that almost everywhere, except perhaps in Zimbabwe and South Africa, the gaps are enormous, right? Uh, with uh, uh, people within the same country completing that schooling much, much more frequently if they come from the top of the wealth distribution than, than if they come from the bottom. And that's just one picture. You could do the same thing for access to health and a number of other um, <coughs> indicators. suggesting that when these kids are born or are uh, relatively young age, um, already their opportunities for achievement are quite different. And those, those kinds of inequalities underpin the income inequalities that we were seeing before. And those inequalities, as I was saying, are behind, uh, uh, to a large extent, are behind the low transmission between poverty and growth. So what does that mean for the future, if we look forward a little bit? So <coughs> what we did... What we did is we tried to uh, project some scenarios of what growth might look like uh, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, looking to 2030. Why 2030? Because, you know, it's, it's when the sustainable development goals that the UN system is creating to, s to replace the Millennium Development Goals that, that finish next year. Those are meant to be by, <coughs> by, by 2030. And as you may know, the UN system is, uh, <coughs> is, is proposing that the first goal be an elimination of extreme poverty at $1.25 a day by 2030. At the World Bank, we also have a goal which is very ambitious, but it's somewhat less ambitious, which is that we should reduce poverty by to 3% globally by 2030. Okay? So we, w we thought, okay, let's look at this African growth scenarios and its elasticities <coughs> and see what we could do. And... Uh, so here what you've got is uh, that black line is the red line that we had before here, that red line. So that's the trajectory that we've already observed in terms of poverty uh, dynamics in Africa. Oops. <coughs> so that's the black line. The blue bars are numbers of poor people. And they keep going up because even though the proportion's falling, again, remember that large population growth rate that we were talking about. So the numbers of absolute poor are increasing. So then we said, okay, well, if we look forward from 2010 to 2030, let's do some scenarios which are fairly optimistic, which are let's keep, let's assume that each country keeps its growth rate in the 2000 to 2010 period and has no change in inequality, okay? Where would that lead us? Well, <coughs> it turns out it depends whether you're talking about growth in... Uh, GDP per capita, or in the mean income on the household survey, because those are slightly different, but not very different. So that's what those two lines are. This is GDP per capita growth uh, <coughs> as uh, for each country between 2000 and 2010. And, uh, and, uh, and scenario two is for uh, the mean uh, income in the household survey. And so what they, they show you is that... Uh, 
uh, there would be quite a bit of poverty reduction. You know, you, we remember that over here we are at 48% or 49%, so about half of the population. And if we were able to grow, if Africa was able to grow for 20 more years in the same way as it was growing in the last 10 years, we would get to between a quarter and a third of the population. Right? Now notice that these are fairly optimistic scenarios because the last 10 years have been extremely good for Africa. You remember my first graph. Um, so you, you know those, those have been 10 strong years. And also it's, this assumes no change in inequality. <coughs> Nevertheless, that would be an achievement to be able to get it down to a quarter uh, up to sli or, or, or just under 30% of, 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 of poverty. Nowhere near the zero or the 3% that the US, that the UN is, is looking for, uh, but an achievement. Now, what does this mean in terms of the distribution of poverty uh, around the world? Because today, Africa contains about a third of the world's stock of poor people under $1.25. If we extrapolated the same scenario to other countries, so we let China, India, every other country also grow at the same rates as they've grown in between 2000 and 2010 with no change in inequality, then uh, this would imply a greater concentration of poverty in Africa. In fact, from a third of the poor living in Africa, we would move to <coughs> between 63 <coughs> and 78 percent uh, of, uh, of the world's poor Living, living in Africa. So a, a, a substantial concentration of poverty in Africa. Okay? So this comes from the fact that China and India have also grown very fast, and in fact, faster than Africa over this period. So even in this rosy scenario, what this is telling us, uh, even in this uh, <coughs> relatively optimistic scenario, what this is telling us is that we would still have quite a lot of poverty in Africa. So in conclusion for this first part of the talk, <coughs> Despite the Africa rising growth story, poverty in Africa remains high and the pace of reduction remains too slow. Right? Now, to improve on that, uh, we need to sustain economic growth, absolutely. Uh, growth in the next two decades, sustained at the kinds of rates we've seen so far, is essential for, prog for, for progress. But it's not sufficient. <coughs> you know, we need that growth to be more inclusive, uh, and that more inclusive means with falling inequality in outcomes and in opportunities. So now let me turn briefly to some of the things that we think uh, can be done <coughs> to achieve those two components. Growth to continue and be sustained, uh, but also to be more inclusive. So the first thing sounds a bit boring and um, IMF-ish, but it's incredibly important. And that is to maintain the macroeconomic uh, house in these countries in order. Uh, <coughs> growth in Africa in the last uh, 20 years, and in particular in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, was based on uh, good policies, but it also benefited from uh, a very benign external scenario. And the external scenario was benign in a number of ways. Commodity prices uh, were rising, and this is what you see here. You see three series for uh, agricultural commodities, energy commodities, including oil, and metals and minerals. <coughs> and you see very large growth uh, between 2000 and 2010, for example. But then for metal and mineral prices, actually you start seeing a fairly substantial decline. So as it says there, although metal and mineral prices have risen by almost 100%, have almost doubled between 2000 and 2013, if we only look at the last three years, since December 2010, they've actually fallen by 25%, a reality that uh, my hosts in Zambia uh, were keenly aware of, given, as you know, <coughs> of the importance of copper for their economy. So uh, commodity prices, which were rising during this period and were very important, uh, 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 to sustain this growth may now be receding. There are also concerns about, uh, <coughs> about um, global liquidity um, and the availability of capital for foreign direct investment. Uh, so here what I have is uh <coughs> uh, changes in fiscal balance and changes in uh, current account balances, so increases in fiscal deficit 
and in, 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 in current account deficits. And what you see there is big increases. You see most of the countries are actually in this lower quadrant where fiscal gaps and current account gaps are increasing. And to have those kinds of increases at a time when uh, commodity prices uh, may be falling and liquidity uh, may be becoming scarcer is dangerous for these countries. That's, that's the point that we're making here <laughs> is that you know, growth in Africa benefited from good policies, but it also benefited from tailwinds. These tailwinds may now be receding to some extent, and uh, this is a time when one wants to keep uh, deficits low and buffers in place to protect these economies from these shocks. And <coughs> on the whole, countries have been moving in the opposite direction. I, I like to say that uh, prudent fiscal policy is a little bit like garbage removal. You know, you don't notice it until it stops, right? So, you know, in your day-to-day -day running of the house, the fact that garbage is being taken away, you don't even notice it. But if it stops, you know, it stinks up the whole place. And that's what happens with, uh, with fiscal policy as well. If the macro isn't in order, then the people that are hit the most and suffer the most are actually the poor, <coughs> okay? So... Now, that's, that's one, one thing. Now, let me, uh, let me now turn uh, to, to the second broad component, and that is uh, uh, investment in human and physical capital. Okay? So in terms of investment in human capital, uh, there has been a lot of progress in Africa in the, last, uh, in the last 10 or 20 years in terms of quantities. Enrollment rates have increased uh, sharply. Where a lot of uh, work remains to be done is in quality. <coughs> so what we have in, uh, in this graph are test scores from, uh, from uh, the, uh, an international standardized uh, uh, um, uh, uh, set of test scores called TIMS, the, the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. And they divide the scores of their students into three categories. Uh, the red uh, are below 400 points. That's, that's uh, low, low scoring, low achievement. Uh, blue is intermediate and high. And green is advanced. Okay? So basically, you want to be like Korea. You want to be at the top over there where, uh, where, where you know, most of your students are in the blue and the green. The international average is much worse than Korea, it's here. And you have about 25% uh, <coughs> of students, or so a quarter of students, doing poorly in these tests. Only three African countries participate <coughs> in the TIMS, and they are uh, Botswana, uh, South Africa, and Ghana. And you can see there uh, that all of them do much worse than the international average. South Africa and Ghana really quite a lot worse. Um, so, and this same picture that arises from TIMS arises from other uh, uh, test scores, uh, uh, standardized test scores that can be compared across countries. So we have had some improvement uh, in terms of the quantity of investment in human capital, enrollment, and attendance, uh, but now we need to work much more on quality. <coughs> and some of those, some of those, uh, problems with quality clearly arise from systemic failures in service delivery. So at the World Bank, we have this really interesting initiative called the Service Delivery uh, Initiative, which fields surveys at, uh, at um, delivery points for, for education and health services, so at schools and health clinics and so on. And uh, here are some, uh, they ask questions about a wide variety of indicators. Uh, here are just some uh, indicators related, related to absenteeism, so to providers not turning up, okay? So teachers not being in the classroom, health workers uh, not being <coughs> in the clinics uh, for six uh, African countries, um, Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, Togo, and Uganda. And you can see some amazingly high rates. I mean, just think for a moment, if uh, at your school or the school that your kids go to, you had any number approaching this, like even if it was Nigeria, which is the lowest there, that means a fifth of the times 
when uh, your kid is in class, the teacher isn't there. In Uganda, those numbers are 57% for schools and 53% for, uh, <coughs> for health workers. So uh, really big, uh, big numbers there. Um, so I've emphasized, I've emphasized uh, human capital. Uh, th there's also enormous gaps on the physical capital and infrastructure side. So uh, here, uh, let me just summarize them in one graph, which is this, this bar chart here, that has uh, the costs to final users of services in these different areas. So power, international phone calls, water, road freight. Uh, and what these are, are the median prices to the final user in Africa relative to final prices to the median user in South Asia. So it's not comparing them to the US or China, which are much more efficient economies. It's comparing them just to South Asia, to, to India, for example. And what you see is that the cost of these services are much higher for African users, right? So power, which is the, the, the least egregious of them, you know, it costs twice as much to get electricity on average in Africa than it does in South Asia. To move your goods by road, it costs three times as much in Africa than it does in South Asia. Now, the causes for that are big infrastructure gaps. They are fragment, spatial fragmentation of these economies, a number of smaller <laughs> countries with uh, dispersed populations, uh, lots of borders to deal with. Each of those things add to costs. So, uh, uh, you know, geographic fragmentation, lack of competition in some cases, oligopolized or monopolistic trucking sectors. So there's a number of different causes to this, and they vary by sector. But the consequences are, uh, are that the, the cost to the downstream user, both the household and the firm, are very high. So if you remember, for example, the picture I was showing about how manufacturing is not rising as fast in Africa um, as uh, services or other sectors are, and it's probably you know, rising less than many African policymakers would like, uh, <coughs> I suspect that this picture has a lot to do with it. Right? <coughs> how can you... Uh, How can you expect firms to be competitive and expand and be able to find markets and so on when their power is much more expensive and when the cost of moving goods uh, uh, on roads is much, is much higher, right? So these infrastructure service costs are, are very high. Okay, uh, le let me skip that one. Uh, so let me now come, so I was talking, you know, we, we talked about the growth profile we talked about how the link between that growth and poverty is weaker than we would like and the role of inequality in that. Um, and then I started going through these policy areas. The first two, as I said, were broadly neutral in terms of distribution. They have to do with maintaining macroeconomic stability and they have to do with investment in human and physical capital. Now, of course, investment in human and physical capital can be targeted to the poor, so you could make that distribution focused. But in general, we, we need it across the board. So those are broad distribution neutral things. Let me turn now to, <coughs> to two uh, areas which are really about inclusion or inclusiveness of the growth process. The first one is to promote growth in the places and sectors where the poor are. And here I want to begin a little bit again with some arithmetic. So this kind of uh, odd looking graph is um, what we call an ISO growth line. Uh, which we computed for a particular economy, that's actually Zambia as it happens, which had a very large headcount in 2010, 75% of the people were poor, and it had a high Gini, it had a Gini of 57.4. So what we want to know is if this country grows for, for 20 years, so we're simulating it from 2010 to 2030, like that scenario that I showed you earlier, right? So for 20 years, if it grows, at this quite good rate here, 3.6% per annum, okay? How much will poverty be? The scenario that I showed you earlier, that was under constant inequality. And constant inequality is that line right down the middle here, okay? But of course, if inequality changes, if the Lawrence curve shifts, <coughs> then poverty could grow either uh, more slowly if inequality is increasing, and that's inequality increasing to this side, so 
poverty is, is falling more slowly, or it could grow, poverty could, grow, could fall faster if inequality also falls. So that line just simulates certain kinds of shifts in the Lorentz curve of a distribution. So you're increasing or reducing inequality a little bit just to simulate what would the same amount of growth in per capita terms due to poverty, okay? So what we find is that if inequality uh, were to rise by 10%, okay, then instead of falling to 47%, poverty would fall to 52%. <coughs> if inequality were to uh, fall by 10%, so fall instead of rising, then it would fall, poverty would fall by six percentage points more instead of to 47%, to 41%, okay? So changes in inequality can change that elasticity. They can make poverty fall by more or by less. But then you may say, well, but you know, reducing inequality by 10% is not a trivial thing. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. We could get six extra percentage points in poverty fall, but you know, it's not easy to reduce inequality by 10%. And you're absolutely right, but the point is that it can be done, okay? So changing the distributional profile of Africa's growth can have large impacts on poverty, and it can be done. What's in this picture are historical changes in inequality for another region, for Latin America. <coughs> Latin America, as I've told you, I is a high inequality region. Inequality has been very high there. But in the last uh, decade, um, it, ha it has seen quite systematic declines in inequality. So what we have here are annual rates of change in the Gini coefficient for a bunch of Latin American countries and then some other comparator countries uh, over here. <coughs> These are uh, annual, um, annual changes in the, Gini, in the Gini coefficient, annual percentage changes. So to get that extra six percentage points of, of, uh, of uh, poverty decline over here, we needed, you know, this 10% decline over a 20-year period, right? Because we're simulating this from 2010 to 2030. So 10 percentage points over 20 years is half a percentage point a year. Can economies do that? Well, in Latin America, over the last um, 10 years, or uh, I'm not sure what this <laughs> is now. Is it, uh, uh, yeah, 11 years, 2000 to, to 2011. So over 11 years, um, where is, you know, so here's Costa Rica at 0.47%. Every country to the left of Costa Rica has reduced inequality by less, by more than half a percentage point per year, okay? And some of them are very big economies like Brazil and uh, <coughs> Argentina. Uh, I'm sure Mexico, yeah, Mexico is there as well, okay? So this is a continent that's very unequal, as unequal as as most uh, 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 countries in Africa, there are some in Africa, as we've seen, which are more unequal, um, which has managed to reduce, uh, to reduce inequality in, in substantial ways. Of course, how you reduce that inequality differs from context to context. It would be a whole different lecture to talk about how Latin America reduced inequality in this period, and I won't get into it here. <coughs> what I will say is that inequality falls, if you remember that Malawi picture that I showed you earlier, <coughs> inequality falls when growth takes place not only where the rich are, but also where the poor are, right? So that's what inequality decline means. It means taking growth to the places and the sectors where the poor are, where they live, and where they work. And in Africa, that fundamentally means bringing growth to rural areas, okay? So here's a little graph uh, based on uh, uh, some work by uh, colleagues of mine on uh, Uganda. So this is for Uganda, and this uh, three colors are contributions of rural and urban areas to different things. So the blue line is a, is, is are the population shares. So it's 75% uh, uh, is rural, so three quarters of the uh, Ugandan population live in rural areas, one quarter lives in urban areas. Uh, but because that quarter in urban areas uh, is richer and is growing faster, actually it accounts for about half of the total consumption growth. So if you look at the consumption growth in the survey, half of it in green is coming from urban areas, even though there's only a quarter of the people there. Okay? Now then if you look at the poverty reduction coming from that growth, 
basically all of it is coming from the rural areas. Okay? Now, <coughs> this is not a general equilibrium analysis. Uh, Luke Christensen, my colleague who did this, and I have argued a lot about how to interpret these things. Of course, there can be growth in urban areas that induces growth in rural areas. There can be migration. There can be all sorts of things which are not captured here. Just as a simple sort of summary of the data, though, it turns out that the growth that is reducing poverty firsthand is the growth in rural areas. Right? So that means that uh, an attention to poverty reduction in Africa does require paying enormous attention to rural areas. That doesn't mean only uh, agriculture, though. Uh, it does certainly mean that we need to sort of focus on policies that increase agricultural productivity, which remains very, very low for subsistence farmers, which is the vast majority of the working poor in Africa. The vast majority of the working poor in Africa <coughs> are self-employed and work for themselves in small plots in agriculture. right? So if we were able to find ways in which their productivity could be increased through rural to agricultural extension, uh, through changes in input use, maybe through rural roads that make the transport of those goods to market easier, uh, you know, those sorts of policies would have high payoff. Although notice, Africa is littered with examples of poor policies in agriculture as well. How am I doing for time, uh, Filippo? Okay, even five, I think. Let me try and go a little bit quickly. <coughs> My throat will certainly be happy if I go more quickly. Again. So, um, so agricultural productivity is certainly a big part of it, and, I, and we need to, to work on that. Oh, I was saying uh, agricultural policies, though I talk about input use, um, and yet Africa is, is littered with examples of fertilizer subsidy schemes which are not very successful at reaching the poor, which create lobbies and are actually captured by better off farmers. In fact, I've just come back from a country, uh, Zambia, where that is the case, and it's the case in Malawi as well. So they have uh, uh, farmer input support programs, uh, FISPs in those countries, um, which don't appear to be uh, making poverty, rural poverty fall at all. Uh, so uh, <coughs> it's not as easy as it sounds. Policy has to be designed carefully, needs to be rethought. The political economy around those policies poses quite interesting questions as well. But I want to emphasize that besides agriculture, there are other kinds of rural uh, interventions that are important. Quite a lot of the poverty reduction that we see in rural areas is actually when farmers are able to move to off-farm employment and other activities that are not farming in rural areas. Uh, we see a lot of transitions when you can look at panel data and uh, Luke and Jonathan look at panel data in, in this case, and they find that quite a lot of the people leaving poverty are those that have managed to get some other activity in addition to agriculture. It could be uh, um, uh, uh, handicrafts, it could be trading, um, it could be a number of other things that go on uh, in, in, in these areas. And in fact, some of those, almost all of those things are actually services, and they are why services is, is such an important uh, part of the, of the growth story, also at the bottom of the distribution, <coughs> as we saw earlier. So promoting growth where the poor are, in the rural areas, in the small service sectors, is a huge part, obviously, of making growth more inclusive. But let's not kid ourselves. This is a continent with large amounts of, uh, of uh, natural resources, uh, as we've seen. Some of the fastest growing countries have huge natural resource sectors. And if you go to Angola or Nigeria or Zambia, where there's copper, or Botswana, where there are diamonds, you're not going to say... <coughs> forget the natural resource sectors, right? I mean, those are big parts of the growth. They attract a lot of investment. So there's also an alternative open <coughs> to these countries and to their governments, which is to harness the growth that's taking place in those sectors, even though they employ very few poor people, um, almost none. The people who get employed by these sectors are not poor. They may not be rich, but they're not the poor that we're talking about here. So how can we do that? <coughs> At a very simple simulation level, uh, two colleagues of, of mine at the World Bank, uh, uh, Marcelo Giugale and Shanta Devarajan, did a simulation. They played around a little bit with, with the idea that um, what if countries took 10% of their natural resource fiscal revenues and uh, targeted them uh, 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 to the poor? Actually, 
Yeah, so these are targeted to the poor. So what they did is they just simulated a policy. What if Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Republic of Congo, all of these countries here, took their natural resource revenues, took the fiscal revenues of that, then took 10% of those and distributed them equally amongst the poor with perfect targeting. I'm not saying that the political economy of this is feasible, right? It's just an exercise in thinking, could that make a difference? And of course, uh, in some countries it could make quite a big difference. There is Mozambique again that you're interested in. Uh, but you know, in Angola, Equatorial Guinea, Republic of Congo, these would be, you know, those are in dollars per year. So this would be enough to eliminate poverty altogether. In those, in those countries. Now, those are the richest uh, natural resource countries. If you look to Tanzania or Uganda, that would already be much, much a smaller, <coughs> a, uh, a, much, uh, a much smaller difference. Now, when I, I talk about this, as I've had the opportunity to do with a few African policymakers, almost always the immediate reaction is, but this, these are handouts. This is sort of cheating. This is not really eliminating poverty. Poverty must be eliminated with work, okay? Uh, if you give this, you just create dependency. So uh, then I, I try to tell them a story from uh, the experience of Latin America with conditional cash <coughs> transfers. I tell them that conditional cash transfers are not a silver bullet. I'm not suggesting that these kinds of transfers are the answer to Africa's problems in any way, but I want to share with them, and I want to share with you now, uh, some evidence from studies of these conditional cash transfers that suggest <coughs> that the money transferred to poor households under these schemes has actually led to some very good decisions by the poor households themselves and increased investment by the poor households themselves. I think most of you know what conditional cash transfers are, but basically they are payments made to poor households conditional on some action by the households that is an investment in their own uh, human capital. Typically, almost 99% of the case, it's simply the following. If you keep your kid enrolled in school, and then it can vary if it's all your kids or some kids, but basically if you keep your kids enrolled in school and we can check from the school system that they are attending classes, you know, 85% or 90% of the time, then you get a small transfer. Typically it's a very small transfer, but it's a transfer that for these households is significant. <coughs> and what the literature has found, one advantage of this, uh, one fortunate happenstance with these programs is that in a number of cases they were introduced with randomization. So they were introduced first to a small subgroup randomly selected from the population, which is a treatment group, and then you can compare it to a control group to actually have a pretty good identification <laughs> that the impact is due to that program rather than to something else, okay? And then later, uh, often it was expanded to the broader population as a whole. Uh, so what I wanna do is just quickly tell you a few elements of, of, of this. One of them, which is here, uh, this, is work by uh, uh, Norbert Shadi and his co-authors on uh, two countries, Ecuador and Nicaragua. Uh, and what, what are these uh, curves? These curves are uh, angle curves. So they are the food share, the share of, of income spent on food at each percentile uh, these are not percentiles, at each level of income. So this is log of, of per capita expenditure. So just think of this as income rising in this direction, okay? Now, angle curves just, you know, they're normally declining in the sense that they're saying, as you get richer, you spend a smaller proportion of your income on food, right? So we know that we spend some amount on food, but, you know, we also spend it, I don't know, on petrol and televisions or trips. Very poor people don't have that luxury. They spend most of it on food. So these are tend to be downward sloping curves like, like, like that. Now the interesting thing with this is that the black lines are the angle curves amongst the treatment group, the people who receive the transfer, and the green lines are amongst the control group, which suggest, which tell you, because they're statistically significantly different, that the program <coughs> raised expenditure on food uh, even at the same levels of income. This is quite interesting also because it's telling you that it wasn't just a movement along the angle curve, as you might expect if it was just the income effect of the transfer. There was also some additional effect, perhaps because they are often accompanied by lectures to the mothers, uh, publicity campaigns, all kinds of things, you know, that target these things as an investment in your children. 
Another hypothesis that people have is that because they're typically given to the woman in the household, that it changes a little bit the balance of power within the household. And we know from a lot of economic studies that women actually spend more on, uh, on, ch on, on child goods than men which I strongly object to because I think I'm a great father to my three boys, but this is the evidence uh, that, is, that is out there in the, in the literature. Yeah, so for whatever reason it is, uh, <coughs> there is some evidence that these CCTs lead to more nutrition. Also, which we cannot see here, but is also true, is that these, uh, uh, th th there's an increase in the variety of, of, uh, of foods being consumed, an increase in the consumption of fruits and vegetables, for example. In addition to nutrition, uh, they tend to increase investments in human capital, which is what they are intended to do. Uh, both the conditional cash transfers and transfers that are unconditional, all of them uh, seem to be <coughs> <coughs> on average associated with uh, increases in enrollment. So what you've got here in green are increases in enrollment and then the, the black are uh, confidence intervals around them. Uh, this is from a, a, a systematic review of, of interventions that we did with some co-authors. Uh, and, uh, you know, what it shows is that these transfers actually do lead to increases in enrollment amongst children. They don't always, they're not perfect. They don't always, for example, lead to increases in learning. When we look at test scores, there, there is seldom a difference between treatment and control groups, but at least they're going to school. Now, the best part, which I like the most to tell the ministers of finance uh, that I occasionally talk to about this in Africa, uh, is that these cash transfers, which are intended to increase investment in, in, in human capital, sometimes have been found to increase investment in physical capital by the poor as well. So here's a, a lovely quote that Gertler et al., Paul Gertler and his co-authors, used to begin a, a paper of theirs in the American Economic Journal Applied Economics. They then have... A, a, a full econometric analysis of this uh, if, uh, uh, thing in, in Mexico. But I just want to show you the quote, which they opened the study with, which, which I love, which is a quote from a woman, a mother uh, of a kid in, in the progressive system in Mexico. So she says, five years ago, when my oldest daughter was in school and we received money from Progresa, we saved 600 pesos to buy wood and the other materials for building a chicken coop. And with what was left, we bought a few chickens. Since then, we have raised many chickens that we sometimes sell, and we collect 10 to 15 eggs per week that we eat ourselves. So this, <coughs> remember my little growth incidence curve for Malawi? This is economic growth at the bottom of the distribution, right? I mean, I think sometimes ministers are not as impressed by chicken coops as they are by, by uh, oil rigs or airports. But this is growth at the bottom, okay? And this is evidence that some transfers aren't invested in, you know, aren't spent. Often people will think, oh, if we give money to the poor, they'll just drink it. They'll buy beers or whatever, right? In fact, there's a, a great uh, quote by somebody at the Center for Global Development that says, he, he says, the guy says, I'm very impressed uh, by how many conversations I've had uh, about how the poor would drink their money with fellow economists over a glass of wine. <laughs> so uh, I like that very much. Now, this is just a quote. Uh, but there is evidence for Mexico in that paper by Gertler and Martinez. And there is also some evidence that this is already happening in Africa where these kinds of transfers are being used. So this is evidence uh, from my colleague Dave Evans and uh, his co-authors uh, of the TASAF program, the Tanzania uh, Social Adjustment uh, Fund uh, and uh, transfers. And, and here you see, for example, the, the, the dark blue lines are statistically significant. <coughs> So these are uh, these are uh, differences between the treatment group and the control group in, for example, um, the number of chickens that people have, the number of goats that they have. Uh, uh, interestingly, here the consumption of cigarettes and tobacco actually goes down, although it's not statistically significant. Uh, children's shoes go up. Uh, health insurance, which there's a, a very cheap uh, program for health insurance in Tanzania that you can buy, which is subsidized by the government, but you have to pay a little bit. So that goes up. So, you know, some evidence there um, that these transfers are well used. In fact, Dave Evans uh, got so interested by this little bar here that he did another study that I don't have a figure for, looking at what he calls temptation goods, basically alcohol and tobacco. 
uh, and did a systematic review of other studies on conditional cash transfers to find out whether those transfers are associated with increases in consumption of alcohol and tobacco and found no evidence that to be the case. So almost no significant results at all, and in some cases, negative results, which may again reflect that bargaining power thing between men and women. So <coughs> the point of this, okay, is not that, oh, adopt conditional cash transfers and Africa will eliminate poverty. By no means. Remember that I emphasized that sustained growth is absolutely essential. We need to continue with those high rates of growth that we have at the moment. And those rates of growth will require not only macroeconomic discipline, but in addition, they will require uh, in lots of investment in physical capital. The infrastructure gaps remain enormous. We need much more power generation and distribution. We need better roads, particularly rural roads and feeder roads that allow people in the fields to sell their produce at lower costs in the markets and all of those things. This last bit was merely to point out that some of the growth that's taking place in sectors where the poor are not could be redirected to the poor through some uh, transfer mechanisms and redistribution of the kinds that we have in Europe very much and that Latin America is beginning to have um, without inducing laziness and bad behavior. And in fact, there's some evidence that that money can be used quite wisely. Okay? So in conclusion, what I just said, sustained economic growth is essential, okay? but uh, growth uh, is not sufficient. Remember the simulations I showed, which suggest that um, even if we managed to grow as fast as we did in the last 10 years, with no change in inequality, we would still have you know, up to 30% of people in Africa being poor in 2030, and most of the poor people in the world by then would be concentrated in Africa. So if we are to stand a chance <coughs> Of, of doing better than that, we need to have reductions in inequality, in inequality of opportunities and of incomes, and making that growth pattern more inclusive, both by promoting growth where they are, and where the poor are working, and also perhaps through some redistribution of growth that takes place in other sectors to, to the poor. So let me leave it there. Sorry that I, that I took long. Thank you very much for your lecture. Very, very interesting. I would uh, uh, start from the, your final end, which is cash transfer is a good policy, could, could be a good policy to have growth where the poor are. Uh, my question is very easy. You said also that uh, in Africa, population is spread all over the country, more than 50% is a rural population and so on. As far as I know, they are in uh, small villages, maybe in the forestry <laughs> or whatever. So far, far away from the big cities in Africa. And you said that the problem is power and water. So the question is, I do agree with you about uh, 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 some kind of ma uh, cash transfer devoted to a behavior. But the question is, more or less with the same kind of uh, expenditure, so 1.5, 2 dollars a day per person, <coughs> you could give them electricity and uh, uh, drinkable water and water for agriculture. Obviously, if we have to wait to a big power plant I around the cities and uh, two, 300 kilometers, uh, to transport the electricity and so on, we have to wait 50, maybe 100 years. But with new technologies like renewable, they have the sources like uh, wind, uh, photovoltaic, solar, photovoltaic, uh, biomasses, uh, whatever, they have the sources there. Uh, there, is, there is new technologies developed uh, even here in Europe, we did over the last 20 years. Uh, I I instead of having the cash transfer, or with, with the cash transfer, <laughs> you could transfer the same kind of amount of money, which is one, two dollars a day <coughs> per people. You, it's the always the same story. Uh, do we have to give them a fish? or a net to fish. Uh, so my question is, what you believe could be this other additional uh, way of uh, 
having growth sprayed in the territory, spray where the poor are, but giving them two fundamentals tools, electricity, water, and maybe in addition, a little elf control in the village, you know, and, and the cost would be much, much less than having a, a, any other kind of uh, money transfer or, or, or whatever. And where, in this case, what could be a private uh, contribution to this kind of uh, uh, policy growth? Growth policy, sorry. Uh, uh, I, forgot to to, I forgot to tell my name. It's Mario Baldassare, I'm professor of economics. I was at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. We go to the next. We collect the just three. Yes, please. Giovanni Carboni, uh, Università di Milano. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I really appreciated it. There's two things that um, I found somehow missing in your presentation. One is Nigeria. Um, the Nigerian economy now accounts for one third of Sub Saharan Africa, so one third of the story is there. And according to the latest estimates, the 2014 estimates, it seems that uh, possibly uh, growth in the manufacturing sector, as far as is, um, has been there a little bit more than was previously expected. Um, most of the data you presented do not include uh, data for 2013, these new estimates about the Nigerian economy. So my question is, do, these, do you expect uh, this new shape of the Nigerian economy revealed by these new data to affect your analysis, especially concerning the manufactur manufacturing uh, sector. And the second aspect uh, still concerns manufacturing. Uh, you talked about uh, structural transformation in Africa that is bypassing manufacturing. Uh, and this strikes me because it seems to me that uh, over the past few years the talk has been about growth without structural transformation. Now you talk about the st structural tra transformation, you, you're saying that structural transformation is taking place, but uh, bypassing manufacturing. Uh, and in fact, you de when, you, when you dealt with your policy implications, you essentially told us nothing about uh, prospects for uh, expanding the manufacturing sectors. Do you see any prospect for this? Or, or no? the two, uh, two questions are somewhat related. Uh, I'm Beatrice Nicolini from the Catholic University. Um, of course, com best compliments for your energy. And I would like to know about uh, the factor uh, regarding corruption, the corruption within uh, uh, both uh, political leaderships and uh, local societies within uh, the huge area that you're investigating and the role of corruption within your programs also in terms of uh, loans and economic initiatives. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those three very good questions. Let me take them in a funny order. Let me do three, one, two. And let me start with the third one uh, to say, you know, so the big uh, one criticism of, of this talk, which uh, actually nobody has said it to me, but I think could be said, is that this talk is a little bit like Hamlet without the prince, because it talks about uh, growth and poverty reduction in Africa, but I'm, I'm relatively silent on governance and corruption and political economy issues. Um, and I'm silent about those because I wanted to give, uh, <coughs> when I think about this talk, I wanted to give it based on hard numbers and economic <laughs> analysis. But I am very cognizant of the fact that the fundamental problems behind why service delivery is so bad, behind why inequality is so high, uh, and why the kinds of you know, investments that are made are not always the ones that are optimal, do have to do with a number of different governance problems. Corruption is the most obvious of them, but it more broadly you could think of it as state capture. You know? in, many, in many, many places, African, not everywhere, but in a number of countries, African elites 
control the state for the private benefit of small groups of people rather than the broader benefit of everybody else. And, and it will probably not do as much good to ignore that if we are thinking um, of these issues. So I just wanted to flag in general that these governance issues are very, are very important. Um, now, your, your question about corruption, I don't know if you wanted me to be more specific uh, uh, about it. I mean, there are calculations people make about <coughs> uh, illicit international financial flows out of Africa. So the African Development Bank, for example, has put out a study. I don't remember the numbers, but they are uh, breathtaking sums, right, of, of very large financial flows that are illicit. So there are things that actually uh, international institutions such as the Bank for International Settlements and others might be able to do better than we're doing now in terms of trying to quantify, possibly monitor, and possibly <coughs> stop some of those transfers. Uh, a number of African governments are very interested in, in those issues. So let me not dwell further on that, but I did want to flag that those are very important first order issues. I didn't talk about them in a talk because there isn't room to talk about everything, and I think there is an, a, a narrative there that I wanted to give, but those are fundamental issues. I'm reminded when we think about this of my, my friend and mentor, Francois Bourguignon, who was uh, the professor at the Paris School of Economics that I'm sure some of you know, uh, <coughs> was chief economist at the bank for a while. He once told me when he came to the World Bank, after many years as a distinguished economist, he thought development was an economic problem. And when he left, he thought development was a political problem. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's very much behind uh, everything that, that we're doing here. But I wanted to start with this <coughs> question three before moving to, to your question, to, to, your, to the first question on cash transfers vis-a-vis -vis other public good provision. In part because one of the reasons that I emphasize cash transfers is that if there is a political economy equilibrium that agrees that some of it can be done, this is money that's being taken away from a large pool that otherwise can be stolen, okay, and is actually given uh, to poor people. And many people, uh, or there is, a, there is at least a group of people, uh, uh, including, for example, Todd Moss at the Center for Global Development, who view this kind of idea of, they call it oil to cash. Uh, you know, what, what they, they view this kind of idea as actually not a transfer per se that is just for the cash that you get, but they view it as a sort of citizenship building scheme. They view it as getting a majority of the population of a country that never even thought these resources belonged to them, to whom the state is a complete alien. They never see the state, okay? And to get them the sense, look, this is your money in some sense. In fact, what Todd uh, proposes, was incidentally a Republican, uh, what he proposes is that you should give them some money from this oil th thing, almost as a citizen dividend, like in Alaska. So his book is called The Govern Governor's Solution because it's based on the governor of Alaska's. Uh, and in Alaska, you don't, you don't have to be poor, but any Alaskan citizen gets a dividend, right? gets a check uh, in the mail every year or whatever as, as uh, his or her share of the oil. He says, give it to them and then tax it, says Todd. Because if you tax it, make them realize it's your money. You see, I give it to you and now you miss it when I tax it. Now do something about it. Now I don't know whether that works or not, but there is a set, an element of, of citizenship building behind at least some of the proponents for this. Now having said that, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that, uh, that <coughs> if governments were equally capable of delivering all of these things, then I think delivering power, uh, clean water, and sanitation should come first. Uh, and you're, you're also right that there are now technological innovations that make it possible um, for example, through uh, photovoltaic panels, solar energy, and so on, uh, you know, if we, were, if we had to wait for the grid to reach these very remote villages, then that would, that would be very, very difficult, but now there are better ways. And it's actually surprising that in a number of countries in Africa, that's still not very much part of the discussion. The discussion is still very much on big dams and, and hydropower, which, you know, there's, a room for, there's room for them. I mean, there's a role for them, but I think the discussion hasn't gone as far in that direction as you were suggesting. Um, I think that the cash transfers can be part of the menu in part because, at least in my country, in Brazil, um, where we have a large government and, and a level of development that's, that's higher than most countries in Africa, uh, we still uh, had a government that was fairly ineffective at providing public good. Sanitation coverage rates in Brazil are around 50% of households. Brazil, 50%. Okay. So this is a government that could have done it, didn't do it. Now, 
delivering cash to people we found very easy to do, okay, and it had direct impact. So again, there's new technology there. With <coughs> Excuse me, this eye scan technology, uh, mobile money in Africa, there are lots of ways of actually making the cash transfers go there too. So the question is, is it one or the other? And, and you know, maybe this is, is, is not a corner solution between them. Uh, now the question about Nigeria, very interesting question, and, and for those of you who may not follow the uh, statistical evolution in Africa as, as, as much as the, as the person who asked the question, the Nigerians rebased their GDP this year, which means they changed the year with respect to which the GDP is calculated as a base. As a result of that, uh, they, asked, they calculate uh, with IMF and World Bank uh, uh, validation that their GDP is actually something like 80 something percent higher than it was before. This is what made Nigeria become a larger economy than South Africa and account for something like a third of the GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that, that, that is a very big uh, deal and, and the person who asked the question is absolutely right that these numbers are not here. <coughs> now, do I think that that would make a big difference for my story? Actually, I think it would strengthen the story because one thing that happened in that rebasing, if you, if you, if you remember, is that the services sector was the one that grew the most. So the services sector in Nigeria became much larger uh, compared to others. Uh, so actually, you know, the, the share of GDP in that larger GDP is higher for services. So whilst I think you're absolutely right about the importance of Nigeria and about the importance of redoing this analysis, I mean, Zambia also rebased their GDP, although they had a more modest 25% increase rather than 80% increase. Um, but actually, when you rebase the GDP, in, ge in general, what has tended to happen is the services sector has grown. In both Nigeria and Zambia, that's the case. So I think actually on that analysis, I think I, I stand by my point that in fact, yes, I think people were talking about, uh, I'm looking because I'm, I missed who asked the question, it was you, right? So uh, I think people were talking about there is no structural transformation, but I think they were wrong. And uh, unfortunately, I'd like to claim credit for that realization, but Maggie McMillan at Tufts and her co-authors, first Danny Roderick, but then um, uh, Hartgen in Germany, were the first ones to point to the fact that actually there's this big growth in services. Uh, and in fact, there is, there, there, there is structural transformation, but it's just not the structural transformation people were looking for. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting. I have some new work, which I haven't shown you here, and which I'm gonna show to the annual meetings at the bank in two weeks, which actually suggests that the two sectors that have the highest poverty elasticity, because you can do this kind of uh, growth elasticities of poverty by sector. And when you do it by sector, services is, are very poverty reducing. Manufacturing is the least <coughs> poverty reducing of the three. Agriculture and services are much more poverty reducing. So there are some interesting questions around that too. Let me very quickly, because I think I'm taking too long to answer, but let me very quickly address this point of do I think we need to do more for manufacturing? <coughs> I think Danny Roderick and, and his co-authors, uh, uh, Ricardo Hausman, uh, Andres Velasco and others, have some good arguments for why industry is a special sector. And it has to do with the fact that ideas and innovation leap from sector to sector more in manufacturing than they do in services or agriculture. So let's even give the benefit of the doubt to this point of view. You know what, the standard neoclassical economists would say, it doesn't matter what you produce or export, right? But let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, no, industry is better in some sense, okay? Now then, there is a debate about what to do to promote industry. And, and many people in the debate in Africa now, as in Latin America 20, year ago, 20 years ago, tend to have what I think of as vertical policies. Let's promote a value chain here. Let's create a special export zone there. Let now when you, know, you don't have roads and power costs twice as much as it costs anywhere else, there I think, look, let's get just the basics of these inputs right. I mean, if, if, if the border costs are reduced, if, if you can get reliable electric, electrical power, electrical energy at a, a slightly lower price, uh, if communication costs are lower, I think manufacturing will boom. And it will boom probably in the sectors that are right for those economies rather than the ones that we think are right. Because you know, when we decide to think which sectors are right, more often than not we get it wrong. Okay? So that, that's a little <coughs> bit my, my, my sense on that. So I think yes, it, it, promotion of manufacturing may even be justified, but I, I don't think it calls necessarily for special policies. I don't want to be too radical against value chains because I think there's some interesting kind of stuff there, but the, the gist of my thinking is horizontal in that, in that sense. Okay, we have another round. Yes, please. 
My name is uh, Rinaldo Sorgenti, I represent Asso Carboni. I just want to ask you a question. There are initiatives uh, that uh, uh, amongst the OECD countries uh, promoted, uh, suggested by the United States, uh, that are uh, trying to compel or uh, suggest uh, to the financial institute, institutions to reduce or even bet worse uh, cancel financement funding for the development of power generation through coal usage. You know that 1.3 billion people totally miss, do not have access to electricity and 2.4 billion people in the world have just need uh, use biomass, vegetal and animal biomass for eating and cooking at home. So what do you think about these uh, silly initiatives amongst the OECD countries, the richest country, in order to cancel funding to produce electricity by the most important fuel used in the world and in the most developed countries to produce electricity. Hello, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my name is Aisha Alp and I'm a PhD student at the University of Milano Bicocca. I just have a very quick question. What would you think uh, would be the impact of the microfinance in the development uh, of Africa and in the reduction of the inequality? Thank you very much. Yes, please. OK, yes. No, oh, can, can you give it? Thank you. Francesca Romania Cur, University of Milan and member of the scientific board of the foundation. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, it's a very easy question actually. You spoke about the fact that the World Bank has the objective of reducing poverty and you said that inequality is the, one of the biggest challenges. So how what does the world bank have a strategy uh, considering that it has a very important role that in in africa as in many developing countries and as a, an intermediary for foreign investments and it has maybe privileged uh, relationship with governments and maybe also with um, with the populations are there any main goals or strategies that you are uh, pursuing? Thank you very much. Yes, please. My name is Giulio Gabionetta. Sorry, here. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture, entrepreneur. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, among the uh, African countries, which you think uh, they're going to be the best from an economical and political point of view in the next years, I mean, overall. Sorry, I, I missed it. Which one? Which, which Wh what are going to be the best? Wh which countries uh. in Africa are going to be the best from, econom from an economical and political point of view in the next, uh, in the forthcoming years? All right, shall I take those? Because those are four. Okay. <coughs> All right, let me try and be briefer, because also some of these questions are harder for me to answer than the previous one. So let me, let me try and be, and, and be, and be brief. Um, coal. <coughs> uh, I, I firmly believe that uh, there are a number of studies out there now and I, I firmly believe that the evidence suggests that poor people around the world will uh, suffer from climate change a great deal. Uh, and uh, the use of coal, of course, uh, affects that. I know you're not, not liking this answer. Uh, so I think, I, think, I think that is true. I also think 
that uh, coal is widely used around the world and to ask Africans to not use coal before other people stop using it is unfair. Um, so what I would like to see, and that may be different than what you would like to see, but what I'd like to see is a much broader reduction of coal usage around the world, including uh, eventually in Africa, rather than beginning with Africa. The part of the U.S. policy that I agree with you is silly, only that part, is to enforce this on Africa before others do it. Um, but I do think that as a global community, we should take climate change more seriously than we do and reduce coal usage widely. Um, you know, cropping patterns are going to change in South America and Africa. And who do you think will find it hardest to adjust to those cropping pattern changes as a result of climate change, right? It's the poor people. So climate change will be a big problem for poverty. Uh, and I don't think we can get away from that. So I think where you and I might agree is that asking the Africans to, use, to stop using coal or to not use coal before others is unfair. Um, on, the, on the rest, perhaps we won't agree. Let me just say on that point, though, that uh, even worse to my mind are some, much worse, are some environmental claims that um, hydropower usage across Africa should not be pursued for environmental reasons. That, uh, that strikes me as more problematic because they have enormous hydro potential. Uh, and, and that hydro potential everyone else uses. And it would be very unfair in a continent where there's an enormous need for electricity. You know, I mean, I, I was saying earlier to Filippo, in, in Zambia, not forget the urban areas, in, in the rural areas of Zambia, 3% of households have access to electricity, right? 3%. Uh, no, that, that's much more, uh, much worse than the average in the continent. But the average in the continent is low, particularly in rural areas. So you know, we need we need to let them develop this energy somewhere. And I'd I'd rather they did it through solar and renewables, but also through uh, through through hydroelectric in particular. Microfinance. I I don't know um, about microfinance in Africa as much as we know in South Asia, for example. Or of course, it is a much bigger deal. <coughs> I suspect it could have a very large potential role. Um, and I imagine that there must be a literature out there evaluating some microfinance initiatives in Africa, just as there is one in South Asia that we're more familiar with. Um, I'm not familiar with the literature on Africa, so I don't know what the impact has been so far. Um, um, but I suspect that there can be quite a lot of potential there, and we should look into it. Uh, a very interesting question on the World Bank strategy. I think you were asking about World Bank strategies for inequality reduction, all right? Um, I don't, I don't, the World Bank does not have a, a strategy for inequality reduction, in part because, actually, I think wisely, because I think, you know, that strategy would differ massively depending on whether you're talking about Poland or Bolivia or, or Liberia, right? So it, it does depend on the context to a great deal. Now, the World Bank did try and create something to focus the mind on inequality, and that was, I mean, I don't know how widely that is known here, but when, we, when the World Bank introduced these two targets that, that, that we're supposed to, to have, right? The two targets are poverty and shared prosperity. Poverty is <coughs> bringing poverty down at $1.25 a day to 3% by 2030. Shared prosperity, the target is country specific and is to say, even if you're a relatively middle income country, richer country, where you don't have that much extreme poverty, you should still focus on the, well, on, on, on the growth rate of your bottom 40%. So when they talk about promote the growth in incomes of the bottom 40%, that's their definition of shared prosperity. It's one that I'm not 100% happy with, to be honest, but it's a, it, it does at least do one reasonable job, which is to focus on the distribution of growth. Okay. <coughs> I think there isn't a global strategy. There is an attempt to have a global metric, which is looking at the growth rate of the bottom 40%. That's imperfect, but it suggests it's not just the growth in the mean that matters. It's, it's the growth in the bottom 40%. So that suggests some attention to distribution. And then hopefully what people should be doing, the idea is that people creating these country partnership strategies and country partnership frameworks should be telling us how the portfolio of the bank that's going to be used maps to those targets. So that's the intention. There is always a gap between the intention and the practice, but that is the intention.
Um, we'll, which countries will do the best? You know, look, I mean, I, I recently was forced by my boss, the president of the bank, to engage in the business of forecasting the economic costs of Ebola. Uh, that was hard enough. So you're now asking me to do more forecasting. I hate forecasting. Uh, but I think we can confidently say that Rwanda and Ethiopia, who are relatively well-managed countries, who have very high rates of growth um, without a, an excessive reliance on natural resources, will continue to do well economically. I think we can also say that barring large drops in oil prices, the rich, the oil rich countries of Equatorial Guinea and Angola uh, will continue to have high growth rates. Um, I think we can continue to say on the other end of the spectrum that South Africa will continue to grow much less than its neighbors, both because it's richer and because of uh, a number of structural issues of high unemployment and labor relations that are very tense, etc. Now you also ask politically, it's not obvious to me that the countries that will do best economically are the ones that will do best politically. First of all, because I'm not sure what it means to say best politically, but not all of these countries are, not all of the countries I mentioned are particularly democratic. Uh, interestingly, there is a danger of populism in some countries in Africa. Two countries that I would rather not name, but if you want to do your own research, two countries that have the largest fiscal deficits in the continent at the moment and which have relatively low foreign exchange reserves, and both of whom have occasionally been kind of near talking to the fund in the last few months, talking to the IMF in the last few months. Those are actually two very democratic countries with uh, nonviolent transitions of power from one party to the other, much as we would like. So uh, I'm sad to say that not always the countries that do best politically are the ones that do best economically. Thank you. So we have enough time for a couple of questions more, and then we have to. Yes, please. Yes, I am Rene Rocchelli. I'm uh, an independent and only uh, passionate people. I am a manager in a in manufacturing company, but I am here for myself. Uh, my question is, I, I could say, and I agree absolutely with you, that I'm more expert that uh, South American 30 years ago, 20 years ago, was unequal. There was big inequality. I had to work uh, since 85 with Brazil, and they can say that inflation was very high, and so on, and so on, and so on. And enormous progress was done. Now Brazil is like here, <laughs> more or less, more or less, okay. No? So this best practice of South America, according to you, can be exported to Africa, so same way to improve <coughs> regularly without big trauma. There was, of course, changing and so on, but uh, we, we can say South America is successful, Brazil especially is successful in this improvement. Y you think can be exported to some countries of Africa, this uh, best practice? The short answer is that I, I don't think, uh, I don't think, a full strategy. You know, if you if you'd like to think of a Chilean development model or a Brazilian development model, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily be sure what those are. But I don't think that can be exported. I think the the contexts matter enormously. If there's one thing we learned right in the last 20 years from development economics is that cookie cutter approaches don't work. We, we think we have a template that can fit everywhere. It never works because the institutions are different, the cultures are different, the economic foundations are different. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, I do think there are elements that can. So one thing that I, I talked about the conditional cash trends is because I think 20 years ago, our policymakers and our societies had exactly the same attitude to redistribution of this kind. We were of the view that, you know, to poor people was a waste of time and that they would drink it basically and that's you know a bit of a caricature of what African policymakers think today but only a bit of a caricature um, and I think we learned a lot and our political views changed um, as a result of experimentation and learning uh, and incidentally experimentation and learning from countries both on the left of the spectrum and on the right both Mexico and Colombia that, that introduced uh, very good uh, schemes of this kind did not have left-wing government <coughs> uh, so I think that, that, that is one. 
Um, I think there's enormous interest in Africa to learn from the Latin American experience. I myself had the, the honor and privilege to speak to President Ouattara of, of uh, Cote d'Ivoire and more recently to uh, a senior policymaker in, uh, in Zambia about the Brazilian experience. And they, they asked me specifically to go there and, because I don't want to go to a place and start talking about my country. But they asked me specifically, you know, what, what, how did Brazil reduce poverty in this way and, and the other. Uh, so I think there are elements that, that can be. There are other elements that cannot. When I tell them the story about Brazilian poverty reduction, I have my little PowerPoint. You know, one part of it was a very large rise in the real value of the minimum wage, which worked very well in Brazil, didn't lead to much unemployment yet, didn't lead to much informality yet, actually for formalization continued to grow. But do I think I want to export that particular policy to Cote d'Ivoire? I'm really not sure. I'm really not sure. I'm not saying no, but I think, you know, we have to look. I mean, you can't just go into a labor market and raise the minimum wage because it worked somewhere else, right? So one has to be very careful. When I say that to them, I say, look, I'm telling you what happened in Brazil. I'm not telling you each of these things you should do here. That would be crazy. But there are some things that, that can be done. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, you can't think about reducing poverty in Zambia or Cote d'Ivoire without a huge focus on agriculture. And in Brazil, the agriculture was entirely taken care of by the, by the, by the private sector and agribusiness. And we were, in any case, 80% urban. So that was a non-policy story, except if you go back to think of Embrapa and the policies that created many years before, but that's a different, that's a different story. So the new answer, answer is, I think elements can be useful, but not whole packages. Uh, okay, so any, uh, any more question? Uh, this is probably too, too wide. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't have all that time, and uh, I apologize for that. Anyway, okay, uh, let me just advertise uh, our uh, next lecture, and um, we will have at the end of October Mikhail Levy uh, from Council on uh, Foreign Relations, and he will address the energy security um, link uh, with uh, the hydrocarbon um, exploitation in the US. Uh, we will send you the, the exact date. Now we have a very simple, but I hope nice uh, cocktail. Again, thank you very much to the audience, to you, and thank you very much to Francisco Ferreira for his outstanding lecture. Thank you. Thank you for having me.